If you'd open up your Bibles this morning with me to uh, 1 Corinthians in chapter 13. Again, I'd like to just read verses uh, 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful today for your word. And Lord, we realize we're in a portion of scripture where there is some contention as to what, you, what the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, is trying to communicate. And so, Lord, we would ask that you would open up our hearts today and our minds today, that we would glean that truth today, and that it would have an impact in our life, we pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, we have seen and learned so far that spiritual gifts are from the triune God. 1 Corinthians verses 12, verses 4 through 7. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord, and there are diversities of activities. But it's the same God who works all in all, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one to profit with all. So while we're looking at spiritual gifts, and we realize that it, the gifts are the manifestation of the Spirit of God, the latter part of verse 7, or actually all of 7 of uh, 1 Corinthians 12, the full triune God is still involved. Diversities of gifts by the same Spirit, differences of ministries by the same Lord, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, and diversities of activities by the same God, speaking of the Father who works all in all. And secondly, and I think most, and one of the most important things in helping us to understand spiritual gifts is that we have differing gifts within the body of Christ. We don't all have the same gifts. Having then, Romans 12, verse 6 says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let each of us, let each of us use them. If prophecy, let each prophesy in proportion to their faith. And it goes on. But the point here is that we have differing gifts. God sovereignly bestows the gifts. That's important for us to understand. So when we go back to 1 Corinthians 12, 31, but I show you, but seek the better gifts there, and yet I show you a more excellent way, should be seen as a declarative uh, verse. You seek the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. The whole concept of having spiritual gift assessment programs it really doesn't find its place in the New Testament. And like I've always said, what in the world did the church do for 2,000 years before we had spiritual gift assessment programs? Well, the answer to that is really pretty obvious. They lived holy, godly lives, and the gifts that God had given each believer naturally operated in the life of that believer. Thirdly, each of these gifts, according to verse 8, disappears but love continues. Verse 8, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will see. Where there, are, where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Now, he sp speaks to these, and we'll be coming back to this as we move through this, actually, in the next few moments. But what I want you to understand is that all spiritual gifts, all spiritual gifts are temporary. They sooner or later have an end. They either end as sign gifts by the time of the apostolic age ends, or they end because of that which is perfect has come, or they end simply because we are now in glory and no need for spiritual giftedness. So laced into this passage, Paul makes two, as we discussed last week, two clear distinctions. Again, Listen to verse 8, and I'm going to read here from the New American Standard translation. Love never fails, but where there are gifts of prophecies, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, 
it will be done away. Now I'm reading from the uh, New American Standard because the New American Standard translates the Greek verbs accurately. You'll notice there that it says that prophecy will be done away and knowledge will be done away, but tongues cease. Two different Greek words. Done away from the word katargeo, which means to reduce to inactivity or to abolish. The gift of prophecy and knowledge one day will be made inoperative. Both forms of the verb that are found here in verse 8 as well as its form in verse 10 are passive. That is, something or someone will cause those gifts to stop. But when it talks about tongues, it says, and tongues will cease, pawe'o, which means to stop, to come to an end. And unlike katargeo, the verb is here used in the Greek in the middle voice, which when used of persons indicates intentional voluntary action upon oneself. Now, and again, that particular word also has the idea that it just becomes inoperative on its own, by its own nature, when it's talking about those things which are inanimate. Done away from kartargeo, which means to reduce or to abol- reduce an activity or abolish. The gift of prophecy and knowledge one day will be made inoperative. Something acts upon it. Both forms of the verb, as well as uh, in verse 10, again, as I mentioned, are passive. In other words, something from the outside stops those gifts. And then in uh, tongues will cease, being in the middle voice, the idea here it indicates, indicates a reflexive, in other words, a self causing action. It stops on its own. So, what causes gift of prophecy and the gift of knowledge to end. So what we're really talking about and really and what causes tongues to end or to cease. Well, with tongues or with um, the gifts of prophecy and knowledge and tongues, we're really talking about here the secession of sign gifts, in particular tongues, and accompanied by the interpretation of tongues. They go hand in hand. So when we look at this, if you had ever gone to Bible school, you would learn uh, about this. There are two overriding views in, uh, in evangelical Christianity. The first one is secessionism, and I talked about this two weeks ago. And it means that certain sign gifts cease to function in the church following the completion of the New Testament. And then there's a non-secessionism point of view, which is the one held by the charismatics, that all the gifts are operating in the church today and have always functioned in the church. There are still some of those that are non-charismatics theologians, such as Dwayne Grudem, Wayne Grudem and uh, John Piper, that are non-secessionists, but they are a rarity. Almost anybody else takes a secessionist point of view if they're non-charismatic. And again, I want to make real clear the sign gifts did not cease or end when the perfect comes. Got that? They did not end when the perfect comes. And with the situation of the abuse of tongues in the Corinthian church as one of the sign gifts, our passage zeroes in on that here. So, last week or two weeks ago, I talked about tongues a bit. Tongues ceases. It ceases on its own, middle voice, just voice. 
stops by uh, it's on its own by its own nature. Why would that be the case? And I gave several reasons. Let me just quickly run through those. First, we are talking about spiritual gifts, not God's, and I need to, under, need to really zero in on this. Uh, we are talking about spiritual gifts, not a God's ability uh, on his own to perform miracles such as healing, etc. So when we talk about gifts ceasing, such as tongues, miracles, um, gift of knowledge, healing, those kinds of sign gifts, we're talking about spiritual gifts that are being operated by human beings under the unction of the Spirit of God. That does not stop God from healing or performing miracles on his own. That's a totally different subject. Sign gifts operated during three biblical periods, if you remember, during the ministry of Moses and Joshua, the second, the ministries of Elijah and Elisha, the major prophets, third, the ministries of Jesus and the apostles. And in all three of those cases, they appeared, they, these things lasted about a 70-year period and then just abruptly ended. And the last miracle recorded in the New Testament in which God worked directly through a human instrument occurred about the year 58 in Acts 28 and verse 8. And from that time until about AD 96, when John completed the writing of Revelation, not a single miracle of that sort is mentioned anywhere in the New Testament. The New Testament miracle age was for the purpose of confirming the word as given to Jesus or given by Jesus and the apostles of offering then the kingdom of Israel, uh, the kingdom to Israel, excuse me, and of giving a taste or a sample of the kingdom to everyone else. This is what the millennial reign is going to be like. This is what it's going to be like in glory. The second evidence that spiritual gifts or tongues ended with the apostles is that its purpose as a judicial sign of Israel's judgment ceased to apply at that time. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 21 says, In the lot is written with men of other tongues and with other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me says the Lord. And that's from Isaiah 28, verses 11 and 12. What was happening here was that Israel refused to listen and believe when God spoke to them in a clear language that they understood. So Isaiah says the day would come when God would speak to them in a language they could not understand as a testimony against their rejection of hymns. So... Tongues were not given as a sign to believers, but rather to unbelievers and specifically unbelieving Jews. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers but for those who believe. And when we get over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I will make that distinction between uh, believers and unbelievers, and, we will, and I will go through it a little bit more detail and explain to you why when it talks about unbelievers, it is directed at the nation of Israel. Thirdly, tongue ceased because it was infer an inferior means of edi edification. Why? Well, it needed an interpreter. First Corinthians, again, 14, verses 27 and 28. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let it, be by no more, let it be by two, or at the most by three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. And then fourth, the gift of tongues has ceased because its purpose as a confirming sign of apostolic authority and doctrine ended with the New Test when the New Testament was completed. It was no longer necessary. 
So now we get down to verse 10. So now that we understand all of that, verse 10 reads again, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away. So those things which are perfect, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part. What is in part? Knowledge and prophecy. The succession of tongues took place a short while after Paul wrote this letter, but the gift of prophecy and knowledge ends when the perfect has come. Now, within the charismatic movement, as we're going to see, they want to tell you that the word perfect here can be translated when the perfection has come. There's a real problem with that in the Greek, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the idea here, and what they're misunderstanding, is they're not understanding the two verbs that are found in verse 8. And so what they're saying here is that it is the second coming of Christ that puts an end to prophecy, knowledge, and tongues. And they want to zero in on tongues. The problem here is that tongues is found in the middle voice and ceases of its own initiative. But prophecy and knowledge, again, they're passive. Something from the outside is causing those gifts to cease. What is causing from the outside those things to cease? When that which is perfect is come. So, the question is, what does the word perfect mean? <laughs> All right, let's uh, take a look at that. And, and I'm going to give you a few, four views. The first one is the perfect. Some people believe that the word perfect here is a reference to the rapture. But here's the problem. If knowledge and prophecy have been permanently done away, there could be no more, it could not be then be resumed after the rapture during the tribulation or the millennial reign of Christ. And clearly those gifts were operating at that time. But they, as I mentioned, clearly were operating during the tribulation period. So, the idea of it being the rapture just doesn't fit the text at all. Probably one of the more common and more popular views, which I just mentioned a moment ago, is that the word perfect here is the word perfection, referring then to the second coming. Some believe the perfect refers to the coming or the second coming of Jesus Christ at the rapture of the church. But here's the problem. The word perfect is found in the neuter in the Greek, teleon, eliminating the possibility that it relates to a person. In addition, that view also has problem of the again with the reappearance of prophecy and knowledge because of the widespread preaching and teaching of the word during the kingdom period. Actually through the tribulation and the kingdom period. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 9 They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord and the waters cover the sea. So the second coming of Christ doesn't, doesn't fit simply because the Greek word is found in the neuter and it would also eliminate the idea of prophecy and knowledge during the tribulation or the millennial reign of Christ. Another common view that is held by most within conservative circles, especially those of us who are more Baptistic, is that the word perfect here speaks to the completion of the scriptures. In other words, when the scriptures are completed, there is no need for knowledge or prophecy. Here's, the, here's the, how they were looking at this. They're defining these particular terms of prophecy and knowledge somewhat differently than 
um, I would normally, or and others would normally uh, define them. And we're going to find a little later on, when we get to the end of our study, I am going to go through and define all of the spiritual gifts. And as I mentioned a while back, of the number of books I have, and I, I went back up today and double-checked how many books I actually have on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. I have 11. 11 books just on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. I've read all of them. And when it came to the defining of spiritual gifts, all 11 disagreed. <laughs> and I'm going, some of these guys are pretty smart guys. And if we've got disagreement there, I don't know whether or not I can be all that firm on some of the definitions. And so in some cases, we will look at a couple of different definitions and we'll let it rest there. But within conservative circles, some would define prophecy as foretelling, and then the second half of prophecy being foretelling. Foretelling being prophets in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that gave new revelation of God that was no longer needed once the scripture is completed. That's the argument. And when it came to knowledge, the same thing. They were talking about a gift of knowledge where a person would have knowledge of a particular event in a person's life and would be able to use that in ministry in that person's life. So it was seen as much more of a supernatural gift of knowing certain things that take place in a person's life. Now, there are a number of conservatives to hold, that hold to that view, and it's gotten them in a lot of trouble. And, and I can think of a number of fairly well-known conservatives would sit, who would sit there and say, well, I know about certain things that took place in so-and-so's life because the Spirit of God told me. There was one such pastor in Seattle. And there have been a number of others over the years that have held to that kind of view. The problem with that, it was extremely fallible. And then when it came to light that they really didn't know and they were inaccurate, then we have another problem. Because you see, that interpretation of, that, uh, of, of defining the gift of knowledge means that God the Spirit gave them that knowledge. So the question is, did God lie? Or is the gift of knowledge something entirely different? I think we could define the gift of knowledge is in, in, the, in the terms of Scripture is that that Holy Spirit teaching you and I the knowledge and wisdom of the Word of God. And by the way, that makes perfect sense because we're talking about those things that the Spirit of God has to enlighten yours and my heart about regarding the Word of God that is life-changing. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, a discerner of the heart, the intent of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. So, nowhere, though, as in this letter of Corinthians, does he mention, does the Apostle Paul mention or allude to such a scriptural completion based upon the completing of the word of God. Frankly, the Corinthian believers would have taken Paul's meaning in, in a more plain and simple way as a reference to the spiritual and moral perfection, the perfection to which the Lord has called all of his people. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Then you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. When does that happen? Well, when we meet Jesus Christ, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed. I've always appreciated, humorously, when some pastor says, well, when I get to heaven, I've got a number of questions that I'm going to ask the Lord, you know, theological questions that I'm going to ask the Lord about certain scriptures. And I kind of chuckle because the scripture says, the minute we're in the presence of God, those questions will be instantly answered. 
If the perfect then refers to the completion of the scripture, then prophecy and knowledge, again, according to the way they're defining it, would have already stopped. The gift of prophecy then would have been seen only as that of revelation, the, the uh, giving a fourth of the, work, of the word of God, and that it was no longer needed once the completion of scripture had taken place. And I got to tell you that the vast majority of conservative people that I know, pastors that I know, I sat down just the other day, was talking with a pastor friend of mine, and we were going through this, and he was adamant. He says, no, it's talking about the completed word of God. The problem with that is, is that that means that prophecy, the gift of prophecy, period, has ended, which would mean the proclamation of the word of God has ended. And the word knowledge, the gift of knowledge has ended. That would mean there would be no uh, uh, teaching by the spirit of God by the, through the word of God. Nor is it possible the prophecy stopped after the completion of the New Testament and then will resume during the tribulation or kingdom period. They just don't leave room for that. And in the first place, the verb again, katargeo, means to be abolished completely and finally, not temporally. Another view, and this is a view that I held to for a great many years, is that the, what the perfect means is when the church matures or reaches uh, maturity or completion. The word, the Greek, particular Greek word that is translated here for complete, elsewhere in the New Testament, as a, the majority of the time, is translated mature. And this is a relatively new interpretation that the perfect refers to the maturing or completion of the church. And when you look at the next few verses, you can understand that because he goes on to say, when as a child, I spoke as a child and I acted as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things, which would go along with verse 10 that it's talking about the maturity of the church. And for a great many years, I held to that view along with the completion of the word of God, a combination of those two. So there really could be five views here. Because uh, my view had, had always been that it was speaking about the maturity of the church by 70 AD, the completion of the word of God, and the apostolic age being ended. There was no more need for any further revelation. We had the completed word of God, and the apostolic teaching was over, and now the church has been scattered. The church is mature enough to be scattered and still grow. So that was my view. But, there's one more. The word perfect most likely speaks to the eternal state. Why? Well, by process of elimination, the only possibility for the, perf the word perfect is the eternal heavenly state of believers. Especially if prophecy and knowledge are stopped by the perfect, and we know that prophecy and knowledge continue on through the tribulation period and the millennial reign. Paul is saying that spiritual gifts are only for a time, but that love lasts eternally. And we're going to take a look at that, those last couple of verses there next week. The eternal state allows then for the neuter form of the word perfect and allows for the continuation of knowledge and prophecy during the church age, the tribulation, and the kingdom. It fits the context of Paul's emphasis on the permanence of love as well. It fits 
It also fits his mention of our then seeing him face to face, which will come about only when our glorific when we when we are glorified. And then we will be illumined by the glory of God himself. I like Revelation 21, verse 23, how it describes that. It says, the city has no need of sun or the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. So what is Paul driving home here? He's saying that tongues ceases on its own. It, it just goes away as well as other sign gifts. They're no longer needed because those were sign gifts for an apostolic age. Those were gifts that were used during the major prophets. Those were gifts that were used at the time of of Moses. But knowledge and prophecy end as well as every other spiritual gift when the perfection takes place. When we're in glory. I think it's interesting and, and by the way, totally normal. And, and I'm putting that in there because I do this all the time. As you get older, or if you suffer from a particular infirmity, and I can remember when Dawn's sister Lynn, um, uh, Debbie was alive and she was in a wheelchair with muscular dystrophy, we would always comment, there will be a day when you won't need that wheelchair anymore. There will be a day when there will be no pain anymore. There will be a day when Jesus will wipe the tears away from our eyes forever. And we tend to want to use that, that time when we are in glory that's the perfection. But can I tell you something that's even greater than that? When we get to glory, we will know him as he is. For we shall see our Savior. So all the physical stuff pales into insignificance. For that which is eternal, it is the light of the Lamb that will light our lives for a billion quadrillion years. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the fact, Lord, when the perfection comes, there won't be any need for spiritual giftedness. We'll be in your presence. We will know the things that you want us to know. We will be complete in you. We will be perfected in you. What a glorious day that will be. And Paul looks to that. And that's why he says at the end of this chapter, now abides faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these, which will last throughout all eternity, is love. We praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen.